think if you're an NFL football player, what would you worry about? Injuries. Getting drafted. Once you're already drafted, I, I, I'm sure they worry about injuries. Because if they blow out a knee, same for any professional sports player. If you get hurt, I mean, you know, that's bad news. What do coaches worry about? Winning and losing. Because if you don't get enough W's, <laughs> you've lost your job. I mean, but we all, anybody that's in, that's in a, you know, a career or whatever, you have, a, you have worries, uh, legitimate worries. The, the, the airman on base is worrying, am I going to make the next rank? Uh, the supervisor is, worry, is worrying, am I going to make the next rank? The pilot is worrying, is this, you know, is this airplane fixed by hold or is it not? You know? <laughs> uh, parents worry. What do mothers worry about? Their children. You know, so we all have different worries. And this is one thing that worries me. You say, what does a pastor worry about? Pastors, I can only speak for me, but I think one thing for sure that we worry about is do our people, are they really saved? Do they really understand what God's word says with regards to salvation? And I worry more and more because my Facebook feed and uh, these things, all you know, everything is, uh, man, everybody has something to say these days with regards to salvation, with regards to this is confusion, well, I read this, and everybody, <laughs> at least in my Facebook feed, there's a lot of theological jargon that goes on, and uh, I just worry, you know, do people really know what is salvation? Are people really saved? That's, that's a worry that I have, and, um, you know, uh, so I want, I, I just, um, you are saved by faith without the deeds of the law. Amen. That is truth. And I, and I, why do you believe that, preacher? Well, I want to show that to you tonight. I just want to try to help you. This will be a little more in-depth, so I know this Wednesday night crowd. We've been in church before. Uh, I think you can handle a little bit of the, the meat of the word this evening. But look at Romans chapter number, chapter number 2. Romans chapter number 2. Let me just set you up in Romans. Paul is writing the book here. Of course, the Holy Spirit is writing all this, but the, the argument starts in chapter number 1. It's like Paul has gone into a courtroom and God is there and, and God is bringing the world before him and he's declaring guilty everybody. The heathen man is guilty. Then he moves on after he deals with the heathen man because the heathen man knew God, and when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their own imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to four-footed beasts and creeping things. The heathen man's guilty. But then he moves on to next chapter 2. He says, and uh, you that cast off on that person, you know you're guilty too. Well, I'm not like the heathen man. And, he, and that's why he says, look at verse number 3 in chapter 2. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same? that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? I'm better than the heathen. Oh, really, do you think you're going to escape the judgment of God? Despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to every man according to his deeds. So the hypocrite's guilty too. The heathen's guilty, the hypocrite's guilty, and finally, the Hebrew is guilty as well. That Jewish man who has so many mm, advantages in this life. I mean, if you grew up in Israel, you, you were 
really advantaged. You had the Bible. Amen. If you grew up over in Moab, you didn't have the Bible. But if you grew up in Israel, you had Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 King. You had that. What a blessing to be able to look and see, wow, there's a, there's a, a, a Messiah is coming. Isaiah prophesied it. Wow, look at back here in Genesis. It says that the seed of the woman is going to bruise the serpent's head. I mean, you had, what a great advantage. But here's the truth, and this is part number one of, of salvation. You, you're not saved because you're Jewish. You, you and I, nobody is saved because of some heritage that you have. And this is, a, I found, to be a belief in the world. Look what it says there in um, chapter 2 and verse number, we'll just deal with the Jew, okay? Uh, verse number 17. Well, verse 16 is a scary verse. I want to show you verse 16 because it's kind of scary. Not really, but, I mean, it puts us in our place. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men. Ooh, got some secrets? Don't we all? God knows all about your secrets. And one day he'll judge those, the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Verse 17, behold, thou art called a Jew. And what do you do? You rest in the law and makest thy boast of God and knowest his will and approvest the things that are more excellent being instructed out of the law and art confident. That's the problem with the Jewish people. That's the problem with a lot of people. They are confident in their heritage and art confident that thou thyself, what are you? You're a guide of all those blind people. You're the light them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. For circumcision verily profiteth, if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, and everybody is, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, that's talking about being a Gentile, that's talking about not being Jewish, if it fulfill the law, which nobody does, won't, won't that they judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law? For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he's a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Paul simply finishing the argument here that we're all sinners, and just because you're Jewish, you're not a Jew that's outwardly. Being really saved is not about being outward appearance. It's not, it's, it's not that you have a heritage. And, you know, folks, the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, they believed that. They believed that because they were descendants in the flesh of Abraham, good to go. I'm good to go. That's what they said. Look at John chapter 8. Look at John chapter 8. As Jesus is dealing with these people, look what they said in John chapter 8. And verse number 36. Jesus is talking to those folks. Or verse 33. Verse 33 sums it right here. We go. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed. And we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? 
Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. That's their argument. We're saved. We're good to go. Abraham is our father. We're with Abraham. We're going to heaven. We don't need your teaching, Jesus of Nazareth. We don't need you. We are Abraham's seed. We are trusting that we are Jewish. But people still trust like that today. The Jews still believe like that today. But here's the thing traveling around the world, I've met other people who believe just the same thing. For example, when I was TDY one time with the Air Force, uh, I was in Kenya, and the driver of our car, his name was Barnabas. So here's a, an African man named Barnabas, and I've never been to Africa, and I'm like, oh, that's cool, because the only Barnabas I know is in Acts. And I said, wow, you know, that's a Christian name. He said, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, he said, I'm Christian. I said, great. Uh, I, when, when did you become a Christian? Oh, I was born that way. My parents are Christian, therefore I'm Christian. It's the same argument the Jews had. I'm from Abraham. This guy said, I'm a Christian. My parents were, I was named Barnabas. Hello, I'm Christian. I met a guy just the other day in here. He was a Japanese guy. He told me, I'm Christian. I said, wow, you don't necessarily meet a lot of Japanese people who just off the bat tell you they're Christian. So I asked him, wow, great. When, when did you become a Christian? And he said, oh, my parents were Christians. I was born that way. So people still believe. It's still a, th a thing that people believe. Hey, I was, my, my, my dad was a pastor, so I'm saved. My father's Abraham, I'm saved. Look, look, sir, my grandmother was a deacon. So I'm, I'm in. You meet a lot of Catholics like that. The Catholic religion teaches like that. Have you ever talked to them? I mean, I, I witnessed often to uh, Gunnery Sergeant Tim McGuff and, uh, from Syracuse, New York, A.A. Dorm. He was Catholic. And I would also, you know, I'd talk to him, you know, Gunny, I don't, you know, you, you need to get saved, man. You need to get born again. McKittrick, I'm all right. My Aunt Alice, she's in heaven now. Aunt Alice prays for me, okay? I'm good to go. I was baptized as a Catholic. I'm good to go. I ain't everything that I'm supposed to be, but look, I'm all right. I was baptized as a baby. And they really, he's hanging on that. Like, no, I'm, I'm good to go. Barnabas was good to go from Africa. Why? Because I, I'm named Barnabas. Hello? The Jews here, we are Abraham's seed. We don't, well, what do you mean? We're, everything's great. But listen, salvation, it, you are not saved by your heritage. You're just not. And I, I love that statement I heard one time. It says, God has no grandchildren. God has children. When you trust him, you become his child. But he don't have grandchildren. Your children aren't saved because you're saved. God has no grandchildren. And that's what it's saying here back in our text in Romans chapter 2. He's not a Jew which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision uh, which is outward in the flesh. But he's a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter. Whose praise is not of men but of God. So we understand this evening. Salvation is everybody, it starts with this, it starts with this, man is lost. Man is a sinner. It doesn't matter if you're a heathen in the jungles of the Amazon, or if you are a hypocrite who thinks you're so much better than everybody else, or maybe you're straight up religious from the birth. But you know what? <laughs> um, here's the conclusion. Verse number nine, chapter three. What then? Are we 
better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved, that's what he did in chapters 1, 2, and 3 up till now, we have proved both Jews and Gentiles that they're all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped. Every mouth may be stopped. Every mouth. The heathen, the hypocrite, the Hebrew. Every mouth may be stopped. And all the world, that's everybody, may become guilty before God. Everybody's guilty. And you can prove that from the book of Genesis. I want you to see it real fast. Look at, back in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. The very first man that was ever made, Adam. And God told him something. Genesis chapter 2, verse number 17. Oh, verse 16. So God has formed Adam. And he's placed him in the garden, and verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Thou shalt surely die. Adam, the day you eat of that fruit that I'm telling you not to eat of, you shall surely die. Now let me ask you a question. Your Bible scholars in here, you know the story. The day he ate that, did he drop dead physically? No, he didn't. But God said the day you eat it, you're going to die. So God wasn't talking about physical death. Because if he was talking about physical death, Adam would have dropped dead. But he didn't drop dead physically. What's he talking about? Spiritually. You will, thou shalt surely die. And Adam did die that day. He was separated from God immediately. And he got scared and his eyes were opened and he sewed some fig leaves together and got in the bushes and hid. And God came walking and said, Adam, where are you? And chapter 3 deals with it. Um, verse 17 of Genesis chapter 3, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Um, thorns and thistles shall, thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. That's good for us to remember sometimes, ain't it? We ain't nothing but dust. I mean, that's, all, that's the truth. And Adam, verse 20, called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. That's a picture of salvation right there. They didn't clothe themselves. Actually, they did try to clothe themselves with some fig leaves. And that was insufficient, to say the least. We could say it like this. God was not satisfied with their covering. God was not satisfied with the fig leaves. And we could say that today, God is still not satisfied with the fig leaves of our good works. He's not satisfied with that. And all the way back in the garden, listen to me, salvation has always been the same. 
from this conversion right here, this is the first soul God ever saved. Till today, God saves man. God makes man righteous. God imputes righteousness to the sinner who believes. And Adam, I could prove it. We're not going to get too deep in it tonight, but Adam believed God. Because, Adam, uh, because God said, you're going to have children, Eve, and Adam called Eve Eve. He named her Eve, which means the mother of all living. That shows Adam had faith in God in what God said. Because until then, he heard he was going to die. But then he heard Eve's going to have children, and so he named her Eve. That's called faith. He believed God. And then God clothed them. Their fig leaves did not satisfy God. What ended up happening was an innocent animal. It doesn't say, it just says, and the Lord God made coats of skins. Now where did he get those from? And were those animals innocent or were they guilty? They were innocent. They didn't do anything wrong. But the innocent died. Blood was shed to clothe these guilty sinners. That's exactly how it happens today. The innocent God became a man, the Lamb of God, and he died for us. That's salvation. It's always been like that. I worry that people don't get it because on, <laughs> you go online and you can read all kinds of stuff. And there's a lot of teaching out there today that's talking all kinds like, well, this is how they were saved then and they were saved different then and we're saved different now, but they're going to be saved different later on. And, and it's confusing. And different people worry about different things, but as a pastor, I worry that we don't, we're going to miss it. And I don't want you to miss it. Salvation, a man is justified by faith, by God. God does, the, God does the saving. God does the clothing. The innocent always dies for the guilty. And God does the clothing. Amen. I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ tonight. And that's not by my own works. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Hallelujah. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And so, look back at Romans chapter number 3. Here's how you're saved. We've been talking about it, but this is unchanging right here. How about chapter 4? We're going to, I'm just going to, I got brief time here, but I want to get you to this. I want you to answer this question. How was Abraham saved? How was Abraham saved? Amen. Look, look at chapter 4. Chapter 4. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. What for what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Let's go back quickly to Genesis chapter 15. I want you to see it in writing so you'll know, okay, that's how a person saved. Hey, hey, listen to me. Abraham got saved just like we got saved. He, he was made righteous by God because of faith. Same way. Genesis chapter 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Amen right there. Hey, if you're saved tonight, I don't think it does justice, injustice to put your name right there. Fear not, Tim, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Fear not, Misako, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and, lo, one born in mine house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come, out of, come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. God promised him that. 
And he brought him forth abroad. God brings forth Abraham abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars. In other words, you count how many stars there are, Abraham, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. He made an unbelievable promise to Abraham. The God of the universe brings Abraham out by the hand and says, You see all the stars? How many are up there, Abraham? Can you number them? That's how your seed is going to be. Now here's Abraham at 90 years old thinking, I don't have a child. I'm, my wife's past the childbearing age. I'm 90 myself. And Abraham's at this decision. He can say, whatever. Hey, he could get a good look at himself and say, that's impossible. But what he does instead is he looks at God and says, you said it. And verse 6, and he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. That's how Abraham got saved. And this very account is in Romans chapter 4, which is where we just were. What shall we say then? That Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found Abraham were justified by works. He hath the word of the glory, but not before God. What saith the scripture? Abraham believed God. He's quoting from Genesis chapter 15, verse number 6. And it was counted to him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Let me explain that verse real, real fast. Let's read it quick, uh, slowly. Now to him that worketh. So that's the person who's working who's doing something, he's mowing grass. Let's just say that. He's, he's out in the yard mowing his neighbor's grass. He is working, and uh, the reward is not reckoned of grace, but of debt. He mows that yard. He goes to the yard owner and says, you owe me $10 because I mowed your grass. It's not a grace thing, it's a debt thing. That guy owes him. Because he did the work. He did the work and the guy owes him. And listen, if you make works how you get to heaven, you know what you're doing? You're telling God he owes you. God, I did a lot of works. You owe me. The reward is dead on your part. You owe me my salvation. Let's have it. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. It says very plainly here, you don't work for salvation. You believe on him that justifies, and it doesn't even say justifies the godly. What does it say? Him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the who? Ungodly. You know, you got to be ungodly to be saved. you got to be ungodly. No, preacher, I'm righteous. Oh, no, you're not. Remember the first part of the book here? <laughs> Hebrew, heathen, hypocrite, all of guilty. None righteous, no, not one. But God justifies those people that will believe. Just like Abraham simply believed the promise of God. And God credited him righteous. He counted it to him for righteous. And that's how we're saved today. It's not by works. Because if you're working, that means God owes you salvation. And you make him in debt. Yeah, God owes me. Come on, God. Where's my salvation? That is wicked as the devil. Now to him, but to him that worketh not. I think about not working. I mean, what do you, what do you mean? I think, when I think of it, I see Moses and the children of Israel running from Pharaoh and the Egyptians, and they get to the Red Sea, and they're like, I, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? We cannot cross this sea. Good night. And here they come, and they got the chariots, and they're mad, and they're going to kill us. Moses, we're going to, we, why did you bring us out here? We should have just died. We, didn't we tell them? We told them we would rather die back in Egypt. And Moses says, stand still 
Stop working and see the salvation of God. And God comes through there and parts the Red Sea. God does all the work. They didn't work for that. God did the saving. Amen. Adam and Eve didn't go find the animals and kill the animals and clothe themselves. The Bible says the Lord God clothed them. God does the saving. And that's what it's saying. Him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. That's all the time we've got tonight. But a, a, a man is saved by faith in what God has said. If you're here tonight and you're not sure you're saved, how can I be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Believe that you are a sinner because he doesn't justify the godly, he justifies the ungodly. <laughs> You've got to become ungodly first. And that's hard for people. But it's a good day where you hit the end and you go, yeah, I'm, I am ungodly. I am ungodly. I am ungodly. God said, don't lie, I've lied. God said, don't steal, I've stolen. God said, obey my mom and dad. I didn't obey my mom and dad. God said, put me first in everything. I don't put God first in everything. You know what I am? I'm ungodly. I am ungodly. But Jesus, I see you died for me. You shed your blood. You gave your body. And at that, I believe you died and paid to God. You, Lord Jesus, you paid to God what I owed to God. He paid it for me, and I, like a child, I believe that person, God counts righteous. God credits righteousness. Him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. So I don't, you know, I, whatever you read on Facebook, whatever you hear preachers say, I'm telling you, what I just read to you tonight is unchanging. It will never change. This is the word of God on the doctrine of salvation. You're not saved because of any heritage that you have. And we take a step further. We're all guilty because of what Adam did back in the garden, and thou shalt surely die. But that meant he didn't die physically, he died spiritually. And so every person that was birthed from Adam, they were born dead spiritually. And here we are, we are ungodly. But the way we're saved is the same way Adam was saved, the same way that Abraham was saved, and that's simply by believing God, taking God at his word. God, you said it. And God credits that person righteous. And that's how a person is saved. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for your word and how it's just so strong, Lord, and unchanging and, and, and unwavering. And God, I pray that you would help us to just really sink our teeth into it and just believe it and stand upon it. And as was testified earlier this week, don't be tossed about with every form of doctrine. Lord, may we understand salvation, your salvation, you save, you justify the ungodly. And uh, Lord, it's by faith. And we thank you for your clarity from your word. I pray that you'll help us to spread the good news and help us to rejoice in our salvation. We love you and thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.